small furry yeah. creature with me. Hello, sweetheart. There we go. Good girl. And it's giveaway time. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. That's it. <laughs> That's the dog gone. Right. Welcome to episode 5 of Not Quite Enough Yarn. Uh, this is a vlog or podcast which comes to you from the south coast of England. My name is Leslie, otherwise known as La La on Ravelry, and on Twitter and Instagram I'm known as Knitting or Death. You're very welcome. Thanks to everyone who's watched, uh, whether you're a new viewer or a returning viewer. Thank you so much for stopping by. I hope you enjoy this show show that's a bit grand but there we go um this is a podcast about predominantly knitting and crochet general yarn crafts and anything else i've been up to really and the main sort of thrust behind it it's my ambition to knit down or crochet down a lot of my yarn stash i have a lot of yarn uh, behind me is cupboard number one which is looking very tidy actually i've had a bit of a sort out in the office this week and uh, it's all looking much tidier um, but I rarely buy enough yarn to make a complete item as this shawl I'm wearing demonstrates because there's one two three four I think five different yarns in here um, which go together pretty well so I'm happy with that but yeah there I, I never have enough for one item so that's why the the show is called not quite enough yarn um, thank you also to everyone who's entered the giveaways. Uh, at the time I'm recording this introduction, we haven't quite hit the um, deadline yet for entries, so I won't talk about that until later. I'll probably record that when I do the end piece of the podcast, but lots of people have entered. Thank you very much. There have been two, one on YouTube, one on Ravelry. Some people have entered both. Delighted to hear from everybody, so thank you so much. And... Not a lot done this month. It's been busy and I apologise because I've been really grumpy for pretty much the whole of May. And those who know me well will think, well, what's different about May then? But usually I try not to be grumpy. I think um, I was getting quite tired and I had a, a week off in theory at the beginning of May. And I say in theory because as I've mentioned before, I conduct funerals and... It's a fantastic job, but I absolutely love it. But it can be quite... It, it's not a nine-to-five job. I do a lot of evening visits and that sort of thing. And also, a lot of people do feel that um, all I have to do is turn up and read out the words and shake people's hands. And, of course, those words need to be written and prepared and put together. And that is very time-consuming. So, at the beginning of the month, in theory, I had a week off. But actually, at some point every day during that week, or certainly during the weekdays, I was dealing with emails, phone calls, writing stuff up, um, liaising with different people, ordering music, you know, all the things that, that you need to make it all run smoothly. So I was a bit disappointed because I had this image of myself sitting out in the garden on a sp beautiful spring day, the dog frolicking at my feet, and... Um, doing lots of knitting, obviously, and crochet, and that didn't happen. So I got grumpy. So I hope that doesn't come through in the stuff I've recorded. Apologies if it does. I'm not always like that. Just when I'm disappointed. I shouldn't really beat myself up too much about what didn't get done, because actually quite a lot did get done in terms of meeting, catching up with people. I had some nice lunches with friends and that sort of thing. And I also did a bit of sewing which I shall show you in just a moment. And to give you a bit of background, I did a naming ceremony, which is like a, a christening or a baptism for people who don't want a religious ceremony, for a friend's daughter. And because it was for a friend, I didn't charge a fee. But she very kindly gave me some vouchers for a, a shop. Uh, she thought it sold yarn. Uh, when I got there, it didn't, but it did sell fabric. And in days of old, I used to sell, so I used to sew rather. 
so um, I was more than happy with that so I bought some fabric that child is about to start school so I've had the fabric for a while and it's been a very sort of slow process in as much as I had the fabric then I have found a pattern because obviously you do it that way around don't you you buy the fabric and then find the pattern oh god it's the same with my yarn buying it's, it's just this is what I do um then I bought the lining fabric because it's a lined jacket that I made then I went to use my sewing machine and I have an ancient Singer manual sewing machine which I really love as a piece of engineering as an aesthetic piece I absolutely love it but um, there was a piece broken on it the shirt the bobbins live in little kind of bobbin holder thing and there's a, a piece of metal that's quite delicate and it had broken so I had to order some more bobbin holders whatever the technical name is and by the time I, they arrived I wasn't able to carry on with the sewing so several months later I thought I'll have a go at that and something else wasn't working there was something else broken on the machine and I'd been extolling the virtues of my machine saying I know it's an old manual I know it was built in 1901 but it still works and it's lovely and, and it is lovely but every time I go to use it something seems to have broken so I decided to bite the bullet and buy a new sewing machine which was actually a lot less expensive than I thought and to put it into a currency that I'm sure many of us are familiar with it's probably the equivalent of four skeins of hand dyed which I didn't think was too bad I had never really used an electric sewing machine before um, my mother had had a, a hand one and she taught me to sew at home so I'd always use that one I used to have a, a project in the school holidays most years when I was in my later teens to uh, well, not my later teens I was working by then but you know when I was kind of 15 that sort of age and I would have a, a school holiday project to sew something. So I had clothes that I'd made and this was something to do during the school holidays. I lived in a village. I didn't have many people around me. It was a, a sad tale. Um, so that was on a, a manual machine. At school, I'd used electric sewing machines, but I found that they were too um, too fast for me. I couldn't, didn't feel that I could control them. But I thought I'd be brave and buy an electric sewing machine, which is what I've done. And it arrived a couple of days later, so I was able to finish my sewing project. And I was really pleased with how I could control it. And I think there are several things at play here. Firstly, I haven't used an electric sewing machine for over 30 years. It's very possible the technology has moved on just a tad. Uh, secondly, this machine hasn't been used by hundreds of 15-year-old girls who don't give a monkeys about how well they care for it. So it was probably quite an industrial quality piece of kit, the one at school, because it had to be. And thirdly, I've learnt to drive since then and clutch control, so I think I possibly have a little more control over my right foot anyway. That's my theory and I'm sticking to it. So the machine arrived and I spent the second weekend of my week off making this item which I will now show you and I'm going to have to move and what we have here is a jacket I hope you can see that okay so my my dummy Enid is modeling the jacket for you oh sorry Enid I didn't mean to feel the right to it then um yes as you can see the fabric is patterns of maps certainly not to scale but it's a nice piece I will put some photos up showing the whole thing because I'm doing a very bad job of showing this but I'm really pleased with it I could say it's a lined item so there's the lining and considering I hadn't sewn for a very long time I was pretty pleased with that it was a birder pattern and I'll put up the number uh, although I bought the pattern a few years ago, so whether it's still available or not, I don't know. little stand-up collar there. And delighted with it. I haven't worn it yet outside the house. I've worn it a lot just to try it on and to feel proud of myself. So yes, that's uh, what I've been doing. Now, it is not my intention to turn this into a, a sewing podcast as well as a knitting and crochet one. Um... I don't do a lot of sewing, like I say, this has been several years in the making, so uh, I'd be putting up videos even less frequently if I uh, were to 
concentrate on the sewing side of things. Also, there are some very good knitting and sewing podcasts out there. Perhaps the most obvious one is Kristin of Yarngasm. She does a lot of sewing as well as her lovely knitting work and her hand-dyed yarns. And also Anita at Gaga Knits does sewing and knitting and she's got a dog too called Charlie who's gorgeous so um, if you're interested in sewing as well as other yarn crafts then you know there are places to go that are much better than mine but this is partly my justification as to why I haven't done much knitting this month because I spent an entire weekend making this so as well as being very pleased with it and how it fits it also um, has scotched a rumour because I can categorically prove thanks to the patterning on this fabric that my backside is not the size of South America. My backside is the size of Europe. And that makes sense, because Europe is wide, South America's long. So so that makes sense. So I'm glad we've we've laid that to rest now. And if I get accused of it, I can produce proof of just quite what scale I'm on. You've met Bert, Ethel and Chucky, the disembodied heads. Now please might I introduce Enid, the headless body. It's a bank holiday weekend and it's sunny. That never happens. We, we, we won't know what to do with ourselves. Uh, this does mean there may be some knocking noises. Apologies if there is. Um, my neighbour appears to be taking down a wall or killing someone or something. I'm not sure. But um, hopefully it won't be too distracting right on cue. In the UK, May bank holiday is, like anywhere else, largely an excuse for getting drunk and having a barbecue if the weather's good. Like I say, rarely happens, but we go with it. In my local area there is a festival called Jack in the Green. It's not exclusive to this area, but it's um, quite a big thing here. And the drumming, drumming group, which I joined uh, earlier this year, is taking part in it. Now we've got two events, one's today, today being Sunday, and we have a drum off uh, where we meet with other drumming groups and make a lot of noise. That will be, in terms of costume, that will be in our traditional red and green, uh, red and black. Um, but tomorrow, being the Jack in the Green Festival, we will be in the wearing of the green. It sounds like it should be St. Patrick's Day, it's really not. I bought this top from eBay and it's it was too tight and my dear old mum used to say I don't know why I call her that she never grew to be old bless her but my mum used to say sometimes necessity is the mother of invention so it occurred to me that crochet may be the way to go so what I've done and I hope you can see it the light should be good if nothing else is made some panels which start off at a point here and go all the way down to add bit of extra to the sleeve because I, they were they fitted but I wanted a bit more movement because we'll be drumming and a little bit extra around the, particularly the bust the whole thing then flares out um, and yes it was, it was quite an interesting exercise it actually took longer to take the thing apart and sew the panels in than it did to make the panels as is often the way it's quite a complicated structure this garment I'm just going to lift Enid up a moment do excuse me madam breathe in so you can see that it's quite a, a complicated structure so working out which seam to undo uh, proved challenging I uh, did this using some this is alpaca which was left over from the faraway shawl the big yellow and green thing that I often wear obviously not quite enough yarn so again excuse me madam on the other side we start off with the alpaca and then the colours change. We've got some Aslan, Aslan yarns here, I think, and some other bits and pieces that I've made, I've used for other projects. Uh, this is more of a bluey green, which I'd rather not have had, but uh, it was a question of what I had available in the time available, because this was beginning to be my problem. Um, I hadn't really got organised in time, so I needed to get that sorted. So, as we can see, Enid. It's quite sort of medieval looking. So will I be when my face and hair are green. I'm not joking. I will post a picture at some point 
You might want to use it to frighten small children if they're misbehaving or something like that. But this should be good fun. Now the weather forecast for tomorrow is very hot. So I think that's going to describe me as well. It's still not that loose. I would have liked it a bit looser, but this is what I'm going to have to work with given the time available. And that actually puts me in mind of a conversation I had this week at WI. I was talking with another uh, member. We were talking about the craft fair that we're holding later in the year. And she said, what's your favourite thing to do with your hands? There's only one possible answer to that. Put food in my mouth. Enid will come out to play tomorrow. Uh, our parade is in the morning, so I'm hoping that's before it gets too hot. And then I shall come home, shower, and lay, lay down in a darkened room for the rest of the day, I think. We will be parading for a couple of hours. It's not at a very fast pace, but it's up quite a hill. So um, trying to work out how to hide water underneath all this. And um, I think most people have slightly stronger water, if you know what I mean. But personally, I need to be sensible. I can't be drunk in charge of a drumstick. Right, I'm going to talk about a couple of works in progress that I mentioned very briefly last month in the Roundup of Whips. I'm going to always do it in that voice. Um, the first is The Cowl of Doom, which is in its latest, and I would hope, final incarnation, but I think that's what I said last time. I had started to knit. This is with the uh, Handmaiden Kasbar yarn. I had started to knit a pattern just, I think I was doing six rows stocking stitch, six, six rows reverse stocking stitch, and it was okay, but I wasn't in love with it. And part of the problem, I'm sorry for the traffic noise, I've got the window open, um, part of the problem is the extreme contrast, as you can see when I briefly held it up. It's a lovely purple, but it has this brown beige bit in it. and it just makes a lot of patterns very messy. Now, when I had been thinking of doing a design that just didn't work, I was doing strips of crochet. And what I realized when I was knitting from this is, actually, I quite like that. I like the way it concentrates the color. So maybe crochet was the way to go. So I'm doing a very, very simple cowl. It's just a two and a half millimeter crochet hook, 150 stitches, and I made it into a spiral and I'm just working round and round. So you can see just treble stitches, uh, US name double crochet stitches, and couldn't be simpler, so fairly mindless stuff. I'm intrigued by the way that it's flashing because as I'm always going in the same direction, I thought that you'd have this spiral pulling, but now it seems to be going back in the other direction. I'm not aware that my tension has changed and certainly it doesn't seem to be kind of coming in too much, so must be I don't know what. Yeah, that's really helpful, Liz. Must be I don't know what. But anyway, I don't know why it's flashing the way that it is, but I'm not unhappy about it. So I'm hopeful that the Cowl of Doom has found its final incarnation. Otherwise I will just weep a lot. So that's that project, and that's the hook on the floor. Right. Now I also mentioned last month that I'm making a jacket for my sister, a replacement for the one that I'd worn previously, I think it was in the first episode, which was a blue zip-up jacket with darker blue contrast collar, rib, bit at the top of the sleeves and cables down the front. And I probably said, oh it's an ambud pattern, pattern, as if everyone knows what that is. Now, Anne Budd is one of my knitting heroes, and mainly because of this book. You'll probably have seen it, actually, because it's a bit sun streaked on this one. Um, a lot of people have this book because it is incredibly useful. Anne Budd was the person who made me realise that knitting is maths. And I've just realised the sun is coming in. I'm going to look like something from a horror movie even more than usual. hope this is okay with the light. Hmm. I feel like I'm very light on this side and 
I'm over the dark side over here. So do I need to reflect it back somehow? Oh, please, let's not worry about that. Um, yeah, so the handy Knitter's Handy Book of Sweater Patterns is just the most amazing resource because all you need to do is your gauge swatch, work out how many stitches per inch, and then everything else is done for you in this book. So it tells you how many to cast on, how to do your arm and sleeve shaping, how to do your necklines. It covers... Uh, drop shoulders, so just straight pieces, modified drops, so no real shaping but a sort of square indent into the body pieces, uh, saddle shoulder, I knew I'd struggle saying that, in the round and also raglan. So it covers an awful lot of options and with each option you can make a cardigan or a sweater, uh, you can do v-neck or round neck, huge number of options. Now for Christmas last year I got another book which does a similar thing which is the Melissa Leapman 6000 plus possibilities. Um, I haven't done anything from this yet but I will. Uh, she also has a few other necklines and some different body shapes so Empire for shaping and um, different sleeve lengths as well. So less modification needed with this version if you want to make something with three quarter length sleeves or uh, a placket neckline or something like that but really both very useful books and I also love a stitch directory and I always say that if you've got an Ambud book or the Melissa Leapman and a stitch directory you need never buy another pattern of course that's not true because designers come up with new ideas all the time and we are grateful to them. But these in a stitch directory really do go a long way. So the sweater that I made my sister last time had just a cable plait down the side. I hope you can see that. And I have since then, I think it was also this Christmas, received another book because who doesn't love a knitting book and that's the Knitting Cable Source book by Nora. Now I've heard it pronounced Garn. I also look at it and think it should be Gauguin like the um, painter although it's not spelt the same. So anyway Nora G thank you very much um, and this book is is quite amazing it's got some lovely patterns in it. It also um, has a really sensible and simple thing because for example I think I might do this pattern for my sister it's called the rope braid and this pattern is worked over 22 stitches but it tells you that the stocking stitch equivalent is 16 stitches so you can know from it how how much you need to cast on to make the cable pattern not pull in and I know that in the Barbara, no, do I mean Barbara Walker? Yes, the Barbara Walker stitch directories, um, she also has some cast-ons in the, um, or increases in cable patterns to give you that width of panel without pulling in the overall knitted work. But this is just another great way of doing it so that you can cast on a few extra stitches or you know know what you need to do to make it all fit nicely. Haven't got to that stage yet because I'm making Bev's, must my sister's, uh, jacket in pieces. It's worked flat and in pieces, and so far I'm only a little way up the back. It's um, Aran weight. It is Debbie Bliss Rialto Aran, and I'm using my trusty Knit Pros um, interchangeables to knit it. But yes, I've still got to decide which cable pattern to use. So I've got that uh, Nora G, I'm going to call her that, forgive me if that's disrespectful, but I don't want to mispronounce her name. I've um, got that Nora G book. Uh, I've also got the Barbara Walkers, plus the stick, stitch, <laughs> stitch directories I've had since I was about 17. So I shall find a suitable pattern. I may even ask my sister if she wants to choose it. Although if she doesn't choose one I like, it'll be tough luck, so it might be sensible if I just do it. I don't think she watches this. So yes, if you just want to do a a plain shaped sweater 
something like the Anne Budd book is incredibly useful. As I say, she's a bit of a knitting hero of mine because until looking at that book, I hadn't fully grasped how much knitwear design is maths. And it really is quite simple. You know, if you need 10 inches of something and you're six stitches an inch, you need 60 stitches. It's that straightforward. For some reason that hadn't kind of lodged in here before then. Um, not quite sure why, I'm usually more intelligent than that. But really useful book. Also, if you're experimenting with different textures, different colours, but you don't want to faff around designing a pattern, then again, these types of books are very useful because you can incorporate your design element into someone else's shape. I mean, obviously, that's not if you're looking to design for sale, you've got to do the whole thing. But it does give a really good grounding of shape, structure, construction in a, a very straightforward way. It's never going to be a replacement for a gorgeous pattern that you find. Uh, you know, someone like a, a Stephen West who comes up with these weird and wonderful designs, and the emphasis on the wonderful as well as the weird. Um, this, these books are never going to replace someone like that, but they are a, a useful thing to have in the library. I feel like I'm really selling it, and I don't mean to. I'm just very enthusiastic about them. I'm not on commission. Um, I'm just really enthusiastic about them because I've used the Ambud lots and lots of times, and it's my go-to book if someone says, oh, like my sister did, you know, I want a, a jacket with cables down the front. Well, I can find the cable pattern, or I could make up a cable pattern, but I probably won't. I'll, I'll use one in one of the other books. And just use in this case the Anne Bud as the structure she's already done the work I don't need to reinvent anything she's already done it and for that I'm very grateful uh, first thing I'm going to talk about in this section is my latest passion which is corner to corner crochet. Now in the last podcast I showed a, a twiddle muff that I'd started to make. I haven't sewn everything on it and put it into a, a muff shape yet, but this is the, the finished piece. And it was all done in corner to corner crochet. And I really like it. I'm not that, I'm that excited about the twiddle muff, but I, I really like corner to corner crochet. I had some of this orange left over, so I made a few pieces to add on and twiddly bits. So that will uh, hopefully be of use to someone. But I kind of got the corner to corner bug. So, and I've just realised, no, there it is, all bad. I made a scarf. And uh, I showed this up on Instagram as well. And look at the way the colours have worked. It's such a simple process. If you can do a granny square, you can do corner to corner crochet. It is so simple, but I love the way the colours worked <clears throat> Excuse me, with this particular yarn. Now this was a yarn that I got on holiday last year. We had a trip to Madeira, which was lovely. Uh, it's one of the few places we've been back to. We tend to try different places. Um, you know, it's a big world out there, you try to see lots of it. But Madeira is somewhere that we both loved when we went there some time ago. So we returned last year and it was great. So this yarn... I'm going to show you the label because my Portuguese is non-existent because I'm thinking that would be called Rosarios but I'm guessing it's probably Rosarios don't know, like I say, I don't speak Portuguese um, I was a bit confused at first because this yarn is on Ravelry and it describes it as a fingering weight but it's clearly not, it's a thick and thin single ply but it's much, much thicker than that. And this was actually made on a six mil crochet hook. So clearly not a fingering weight, but feels quite nice. The yarn is 50% acrylic, 50% wool, I think. Yep, feels quite nice and yet glorious colors. So my latest love. I'm tempted to start another crochet to crochet scarf, but maybe I need to just calm myself. And I'm sorry I just jiggled the camera then, I was being unnecessarily violent. I'm going to talk a little bit about finished objects and no I'm not, I'm going to talk about works in progress, <laughs> like I'd know the difference. Sorry, lost the ability to speak. And these are two works in progress that I haven't really shown much on the podcast before 
but they show two different approaches and the first it's a drops pattern and when I'm checking my work on screen and reading it aloud I usually have some knitting in my hands and it's very plain so a garter stitch project or a plain stocking stitch project and the current one I'm working on now forgive me because I always print things off in black and white I hope you can see that that's a drops pattern and it's a garter stitch jacket and hopefully you can see there that half of it is worked from hem to hem and the other half is worked from cuff to centre back they uh, the original pattern was designed for a kind of sock yarn type of patterning, a uh, self patterning. I'm not sure which variation on variegated it is. Um, obviously, that's not how I work. So, I decided to use two yarns that I had in the stash. I have a mahusive cone of grey acrylic, it's got thousands of metres on it. I don't know if I'll ever use it all up. Um, it's a boucle texture sort of fingering, light fingering weight I would say, four ply towards a three ply weight and it's a good neutral base colour. So I thought I would make this pattern and mix it with some Noro. This is Noro sock yarn, a ball I bought a long time ago. So we can see here the first half of the pattern, first half completed. Now, me being me, I don't have enough of the Noro for the whole thing, but I have another ball of Noro sock yarn in a slightly different colourway. And I'm I'm figuring it's working. Um, it's because the pattern is then going to have the stripes going the other way, it's not as if you're trying to match up anything. So I'm going to stick with it. I will make some variations when I'm done. The sleeves are a bit short. I will probably put something on to take them down to uh, wrist length. And I may well, it has a slight shawl collar. I may well enlarge that. But I really like the way the colours are working against the grey. It really is a good neutral background. So that's the first half of it. And I was going great guns, I cast on the second half and I'd got from the, the front cast on to the whole of the sleeve. I was just beginning to decrease for the last bit of sleeve shaping. And I got it into my head that something wasn't right. And sadly that was correct because, and you can see this better when I hold the pieces up the other way, because the front has the shawl collar built in, or the, the band and shawl collar built in, it's wider than the back piece. So you can see wrong side, right side. And I had done it all wrong. Basically I'd done it so that the other half of the sweater, the jacket, would show the what I'm calling the wrong side. I mean, some people like this effect, that's fine but I want the, the cleaner lines and it would have meant having the more mottled blurry lines. And I had this laid out on the floor for a while and I kept looking at it to see if there was any way that I could not unpick a lot of it. And there wasn't, but I didn't want to make that decision quickly because I've had a situation in the past where I've unpicked frog load of stuff and they realised actually it was right so I've then had to re-knit stuff that was absolutely fine in the first place. Didn't want to be in that situation again. But sadly that wasn't the case this time. So I've unpicked it. And I'm now kind of that far into the sleeve on the other piece. So that's that one. So a lot of unpicking and re-knitting. But for this I feel it's worth it. The reason why I'm emphasising that point is because my ability to make mistakes is impressive. If it was an Olympic sport, you'd be looking at the gold medalist. Because I have on the go another Faroe shawl. I so love the, the big greeny yellow thing that I thought I'd make another. And I, I'm making up the pattern as I go along pretty much. 
But I started off and I have this slight, obviously it will be better when it's blocked, but I have this slight edge and a few beads just to give it a bit of interest. What I'm going to do with this is every 20 rows I'm going to change the pattern of it. So I've got plain stocking stitch for the first 20 rows, I've got these lace vertical stripes and I'll see how the mood takes me for the next one. I'll get the pattern, the pattern stitch book out or I'll just do something from my head. So Now I did make a mistake in this because you can see that I miscalculated somewhat and mis misknitted, there is such a word, and I have a little double notch there. A little double thing. I'm calling it a notch because it reminds me of the notches in sewing patterns and when you have the tissue sewing patterns. So I'm going to call this shawl notches and because I like it I'm going to call it Buenas Notches. Oh, sorry. Now, as you can see I was only a few rows in when I realised this and so I should have perhaps unpicked it and start again. But this was my second attempt at starting the shawl and I lost the will. I just thought, no, I'm going to live with it. And that's for a number of reasons. This cardigan, when it's finished, will be worn outside the house. If it looks smart enough, I'll wear it when I go and visit families and things. So it'll be a, a work garment, potentially. This shawl is never going to leave the house. Come the winter, it's probably never going to leave my back. So I thought I'd put up with the... Um, the errors. Don't judge me. I'm only human. I know there are people that would be driven mad by that. Uh, I have a knitting friend who, if she's aware of one stitch out, she has to drop the stitch down, pick it all up. Um, she's quite a perfectionist. I admire that. I'm not, you know, fair play to her. She does produce beautifully knitted stuff. Um, but that's not the way I operate. And it's about kind of fitness for purpose. Like I say, if this looked really odd, kind of clean lines on one side, blurred lines on the other, and that wasn't the look I was going for, no, that I wasn't going to put up with that. Whereas this one, I will happily put up with this because it's just going to sling over my shoulders and live in this office. Now this needle is enormously long. I do like pointy sticks. I know some people don't, they find it, pierces the skin because of the way that they knit but I do like my sticks pointy and these are Addy lace needles and I got them some years ago and I ordered them from Germany and it was one of these situations where the shipping costs were quite expensive and I was on a budget as we all are all the time so I ordered them and I thought well it would be sensible to order the longest ones they do so these are about five feet long they are enormous, which for a fairy shawl is great. But when you're doing something that requires magic loop, that's a good way to build up your biceps. I can't remember what I was making with a pair of these because I've got these in a number of different sizes. And I was doing something circular and magic looping it and I thought, why does my arm ache so much? And it was because I was pulling the needle through repeatedly. So that's why I tend to use interchangeables rather than these, but I do like them and for lace work, which is what we have part of the way here, they do work beautifully, lovely and smooth. Like I said, I like pointy sticks and I do like the Addies. The yarn, this is John Arban 100% Merino Lace Weight. I've got that in two colours and I'm also, I'm, and I'm working two strands at a time. I've also got with it some, I think it's Fibre space, I think, infinity lace. And hopefully you can see just how fine this is. It's like sewing thread. When I wound this onto the cake, I realized that I was working in kilometers, not even meters anymore. So there's a lot of it. I got it at Alexandra Palace, uh, the big yarn show, the first time I went there. And I thought, I'm going to make lace things. Why would I do that? And once I got it home, I thought, what on earth am I going to make with this? And I thought, well, I'll have to crochet with it because that would be quicker than knitting as a general rule. But even so, it's just so fine. But with the merino, because this is 100% silk, with the merino, 
I just really like the way it looks and the way it feels. It's not showing it very well, unfortunately. My middle row of the shawl will be, and now I can't remember what this lace weight yarn is or where I got it from. It's kind of in the stash. I've got two balls this size because I split. That one's on the floor. There's the other one. I have got two balls this size. <laughs> Uh, I split the ball so that I could use two yarns together. And I'm going to carry on using the Infinity Silk. And then the final part is back on the John Arban, but in a cream. So we'll go from the very dark teal to this pale... What do you call that? Pale teal? Pale turquoise? Pale blue? That colour, anyway. And then onto this lovely cream, natural sort of colour. But still with this as a, a kind of continuity thread running through it. So I don't know how long this shawl is going to take. Um, because it is a bottom-up Ferroese construction, I am decreasing four stitches each right side row. So it's ever getting smaller. And there will be times when I decrease the central panel as well. So ever getting smaller and smaller. But you're starting off with an awful lot of stitches. So it's going to take quite a while. Um, it's a fairly mindless knitting project, which um, is nice to have. I took it along to Knit Night last night because even with these um, vertical uh, yeah, vertical lace sections, very straightforward. So a nice sociable project rather than anything more complicated. And hopefully it'll be done by next winter because that's when I'll be looking to use it. If not, I'll have to make a big corner to corner shawl. Now there's a thought. Before I do the rest of the works in progress, i um, just show you a, another scarf that I've walked up. This is in a finer weight yarn. This is in a four ply weight. I've got some four ply uh, plain colour, I think it's 100% wool, and also some sock yarn, which is why we've got a bit of variation in the colour. And I'm doing it on two rows, or two returns of the white, and one of the contrast. So we'll see how that turns out. And now it's time for Roundup of Whips. I really feel like that needs a theme tune. I'll work on that. That's our drums. No, I won't. Right, um, then I'm going to go through the works in progress in the order that I rotate them on my list. Apologies, because it feels like sweet nothing's been done this month. Um, ugh, I'll stop moaning, but yeah, it just feels like I haven't had much time. I've had a lot of evenings when I've had work commitments or other commitments. So um, not a lot of progress, but I will show you how I've been getting on with stuff and just recap on what I've got going on. So the first one is the four-ply uh, cardigan. And this is my variation on the panel jacket by Carol Lapin. I hope that's how her surname's pronounced. This is the first panel. This was blocking last month. And I think I'd got to about here uh, in the second panel. That's now upstairs blocking at the moment. And I've started the third, which is where we are here. Um, this is worked in Aracania Ranco, which is a sock yarn. And the contrast grey is some King Cole, I think it's 100% wool of some sort, ever the technician. And there are about four panels this width. Um, so we've got the centre back here, we've got four panels width, which then kind of make up the, the sides and the back. And obviously I'm eating yarn again. And... Then the sleeves, which I may well do in two panels. I think the original pattern just has it in one, but I think I might do it in two. So that's where we're at. It's a very simple knit. I've got a couple of decreases to make for sort of hip to waist shaping. But apart from that, it's just knitting straight for about 200 rows. The original pattern um, has slightly staggered length of panels. I'm going for all one length because that's the, the design that I'm after. It's... 
I'm, it, I'm, I'm taking real liberties with this pattern. It's, it's going to be a very loose adaptation of it, but it's there as the basic structure. And it was the inspiration. And I want to give the designer Carol Apin um, credit uh, for being the inspiration. Whether she would want it when she sees the finished object is another matter, but we'll see. So yes, we have one panel completed and blocked. The other, is, the second is blocking, and the third on the needles. The next project is the uh, pattern which I'm calling Come Here to the Side because it's a drops pattern called Come Here but I'm making it into an asymmetrical cardigan rather than a plain button up down the middle. I think last month I just divided for the sleeves and got to about here and I've knitted that much onto the sleeve. I have realised uh, that the pattern has sort of well kind of this length sleeve and I'd like wrist length so I am doing more I, I could have finished the sleeves by now if I wanted to follow the pattern recommendation on that but I'm going to make them wrist length so I'm keeping going just a few more decreases slightly less frequently I think there were once every four rows top down from shoulder down now I've got to this length I'm doing it once every six rows just to, to taper it in slightly. The yarn is by the now defunct Texair yarns. It's 100% what's it called? Dynasty silk. Pure Chinese burette silk, naturally textured. Well, there you go. And you can see if I hold up this pink against the grey, hopefully you can see that I am sort of getting through it. I'm hopeful that there'll be enough of this pink to see the end of this sleeve and the other sleeve and then I'll start my, working my way down. The reason why I say that is I only have one cone of this colour. I think it's actually called coral rather than pink but it's a sort of very pale colour. And so once uh, I've run out of this I'll add in another one to keep the combined weight of the yarns the same but there will be a, a bit of a subtle shift in colour. I'm holding four strands together with this, which is a Little Knitting Company Top 50, and that's a 50% acrylic, 50% nylon, or um, sorry, 50% mohair yarn. Lovely and soft. It's giving the whole piece quite a nice kind of halo and quite a nice feel. I don't think I have enough of this for the entire jacket. I do have some plain white mohair which I will use once this has run out. Um, absolutely no problem in getting the sleeves done and probably quite a bit of the body with this, but I will have to put in a, a different yarn when I get to the, um, sort of, most of the way down the body, I think. So that's that cardigan. Again, it doesn't feel like I've got much done on it, but uh, it's quite a, it's a relatively fine gauge for me. So that may be one of the reasons why it feels slow, plus the fact as I said earlier, a lot of work commitments this month, a lot of other commitments this month. Fun stuff, but it's it's taking valuable knitting time away. Do the people in my life not realise what I'm here to do? I mean, for goodness sake. Next project is the Divi hoodie. And I have divided for the neck. That's where we're at with this. I think I was... Ah, that's where I was last time. There we go. So I've done a few rows on that, divided for the neck, and yeah, I've just got the two shoulders to work. Now it's a placket neckline, so it's not sort of like this, It'll, there's a, a few rows to work here. But um, it's coming along, it's a re coming along at a reasonable pace. And that yarn, the red, is also Aracania. This is Aracania Olmo, which is 100% cotton. And I've combined it with some drops muscat in this white and in this beige colour as well. The idea for this is that the sleeves, I think my idea is that the sleeves will be red and white, the hood will be red, and this beige is only on the front and back pieces. I think that's the plan. I hope so, because I've used up all the beige, so let's hope so. So that's coming through all the works in progress at the moment. That won't last. Um, I'm rather interested in some knit-alongs that are appearing on the list for June, so I'm so weak. 
And I need to think seriously about the things I'm making for the craft fair at the end of the year. And I may have to put some of these bigger projects on the back burner and rattle through some accessories, scarves, hats, mittens, that kind of thing. Because um, I'm conscious that it's now May. I've basically got five months to fill up a stall of, of items for sale. And I've got some uh, pieces that I've made, some uh, jewellery pieces. I do a bit of polymer clay work, so I've got some of those to display but principally um, I'm using it as a good opportunity to use up stash so time to get cracking with scarves and stuff like that and cows and and because it will be in October that the sale is being held I'm hopeful that people will be attracted by warm cozy things and with an eye towards Christmas even it's at the end of October the fair so um, we shall see I have done a craft fair once before in which I sold nothing. So that's not an unknown experience for me. It wasn't a pleasant one, but it's not unknown. So it has, it does mean my uh, bar is set nicely low. I've got well-managed expectations for this, but we shall see. Uh, as I, d I agreed to be on the steering committee for the craft fair because as I'd like a stall I feel it's you know it's only fair to be involved so I turned up at about 25 to 8 for the meeting thinking I was about five minutes later oh, so sorry I'm late got in sat down made my entrance because I was late and they started rattling through all the things they they'd achieved already I'm like I wasn't that late was I and the lady who was hosting it she's such a lovely lady she said, well, you are a little late I said, 7.30? She said, no, we started at 7. Oh, God. Oh, I'm glad I don't do that with funerals. Yes, so I've... I don't know where I'm at at the moment, but um, hopefully I'll get more organised and I'll get more made and more done so that there'll be things to sell. And judging by my record with that meeting as a start... Hopefully I'll just turn up on the right day with my stuff for the fair when it happens. I mean, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? So those are my works. It's prize time. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Sorry, <clears throat> I can only apologise for my behaviour. Now, I said I would put some sweet treats in with the yarn prizes. And we have some fudge, which I got at a local kind of farmer's market fair type of place. It's just vanilla fudge. Um, it looks of the homemade grainy, almost Scottish tablet type rather than the smooth stuff. But I'm sure it would be absolutely delicious. And if you're not British, you won't know what these are. These, my good friends, are sticks of rock. If you are British, of course, you, you are very familiar with these. And uh, if you know Graham Greene's Brighton Rock or the old black and white film with Richard Attenborough in it, you'll have heard Brighton Rock. I think the best way I can describe it is hard candy. I think that's the equivalent. And it's just a real tradition of the British seaside. And I have a spare here. Spare, of course, means mine. And I'm going to show you what makes rock rock. Not the fact that it's hard, but it has the name of the place where you've bought it going all the way through. I don't know if I can focus that. But I got this in Hastings. So it has the name Hastings going all the way through. Just really strong memories of childhood. Whenever we went to the seaside, be it a holiday or a day trip, there'd be a stick of rock. The pink ones are mint flavoured. I don't know why. I don't make the rules. And the stripy ones should be fruit flavoured. So they are going in with the packs. So let's get out some prizes. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm getting so excited. I'm not getting this stuff, but hey. Um, so the first one is the competition that was on Ravelry. And that was for three balls of this naturally dyed yarn with onion skins which was bought from Ireland Spied Fibres. You also have a little notebook from Gemma Textiles, the fudge, 
the stick of rock and the bottle of Romney Wash Walls Shampoo. And both of these giveaways were talking about old stash memories. Um, so either memories of thoughts of our oldest stash or memories of stash when we were young. And in this Sussex Trug, which was probably made in China because most things are, but it's a Sussex Trug by design. I will rummage through and pull out a winner. And throw a few things around as well. Oh, this is, isn't going well. Um, as you can see, I'm doing this the old fashioned way. I picked up names and printed them all out and then cut them up to do them completely randomly. That's going to be my winner. Um, it's a bit of faff, but whilst I was doing it, I was watching the lovely Barbara on the Flame and Fibre podcast. I really like Barbara. She's so honest and she talks about, you know, getting fed up and losing her knitting mojo and then getting it back and how much stash she's got and a dog that drives her mad. There's, there's a lot I can relate to in Barbara. But this is the winner. And this is a message from Just Magic Maria. And she wrote, the oldest yarn in my stash is some mercerised cotton, tacky yarns cotton classic, that I bought to make Sally's favourite summer sweater by Sally Melville from her book The Knitting Experience. I was trying to teach myself to knit. I got frustrated after one panel and put it away, probably 2003 or 4, and the yarn has sat there mocking me ever since. Maria, it hasn't mocked you. It's just been sitting there waiting for you. Now I crochet, and I should think of something to make out of that yarn, since it's a lovely blue. And then nice things about the podcast. So thank you very much, Just Magic Maria. I will contact you on Ravelry to get a postal address from you to get that yarn to you. The other giveaway with the sweet treats and the book is the two balls of Romney Marsh yarn. Oh, I forgot, both prizes have a little combined stitch maker progress keeper made by my own fair hands. And also with this one, there is some woolly wash, also from Romney Marsh sheep, Romney Marsh walls, apologies. So we will pull this in the traditional fashion from the hat. This is my drumming when it's not windy hat because it's a bit loose so it'll blow away if I'm outside. I don't want to be fighting my hat as well as my drum, that's just not fun. But she said looking away to be completely random in her pulling out of things. Here it is. And this is a comment from Jez Butterworth. Wonderful Leslie... <laughs> thank you let's try that again properly wonderful memories leslie the bin, bin bag made me smile i remember being a similar age and visiting a great aunt she worked in a local slipper factory and gave me permission to look through the bin bag it was full of fuzzy fuzzy pieces of fabric and soft fluffy trims off ladies slippers a couple of inches wide all different lengths if you ran your hand down them on a hard surface the piece would rear up like a python snake I used to think this was wonderful and got to take some home with me. Strange child was I. One of my earliest knitting memories was working a pattern and making myself a cardigan for school. I was thrilled, my first attempt at pockets. No one else was quite as thrilled when I told them the news and I couldn't understand why. But I used to love digging my hands deep into the pockets. I also remember being disbelieved at school when I said I'd knitted my own cardigan. Navy blue. Haven't worked with that colour since, I don't think. Thank you very much, Jez Butterworth. I will contact you on YouTube, ask you to let me have postal address so I can get the prize to you. So thank you very much to everyone who entered the giveaways. It's been really lovely to read all of your memories. And interesting how some themes emerge. There are a group of people that didn't have knitters or crocheters in the family, so they've um, developed their own stash and learnt their own techniques. Other people have memories similar to me of family memories. And one thing that I'd completely forgotten that was very commonplace, certainly when I was a kid, was the yarn shop with laybys or put-bys so that you would order a, a sweater quantity of yarn and go and pick up one or two balls as you needed it and could afford it. And then what you didn't use, the yarn shop would sell on to someone else. And that 
memory made me feel all warm and fuzzy because I remember our village shop doing that. I, our, we had a couple of village shops and both of them sold yarn. Uh, both of them were also post offices. One was also a sort of general store and butchers. It was, yeah, it was, God, it sounds like it was the 18th century, not the late 20th. But anyway, um, yeah, just really happy memories. And I guess this is one of the reasons why perhaps people didn't have the big stashes that we have now. And also the way we buy yarn. We get stuff at shows and fairs. When we see stuff, we get it because it was an indie dyer. We don't know if they'll have it again. So, yeah, just really lovely memories. And thank you all so much for entering the giveaways. I'm sorry I've only got two prizes to give away. I'd, I'd love to give away more. On that note, I have been contacted by an indie dyer, uh, the lovely Hayley, who is getting some stuff in the post to me. So on the next podcast, we'll have another giveaway. Uh, which means I've got to think of a subject, but I'm sure that won't be a problem. So, yeah, really looking forward to that. And thank you to Hayley for the donation. Thank you in advance. I look forward to seeing it and not putting it into my own stash. Oh, that's going to be hot. Right, I'm just about to wrap things up for this month. Um, it's been another mammoth podcast. I do apologise. I was apologise. I was going to get it down to kind of under 40 minutes, but I have a fe horrible feeling we've gone over. But thank you very much for spending your time with me. It is much appreciated. And I came to a revelation this morning. I was feeling a bit guilty about all the whinging I'd done about not getting stuff finished. And I guess it's partly because I'm such a project knitter that I like to get things done or be able to tick things off rather than just keep plodding through great great swathes of whatever it is I'm working on but actually it's not a race it's not a competition why I thought it was I'm not sure and I just need to chill and enjoy the pleasure is in the knitting yes it's in the finished things as well but it's actually in the crochet in the knitting working the stitches feeling the yarn creating lovely things, enjoying the process as it happens. So hopefully I'm going to be a bit more zen, a bit more mindful, a bit more chilled, a bit less miserable, and I will let you know how I get on. Um, normal format, next month, um, I'll record throughout the month, put it together, post it last weekend in June. Thank you again. I really am grateful that you spend your time here, that you like the podcast, that you subscribe to it, that you click all the buttons. Um, thank you for that. Technician at work, obviously. And yeah, just have a great month um, wherever you are in the world. If it's getting warmer, if you're in the northern hemisphere, I hope it's sunny and bright. If you're in the southern hemisphere, I hope it's not too cold. And thanks everyone for watching. Have a good month. Happy knitting, happy crochet, happy crafting, and see you soon. Take care.